Welcome to London Rising. I'm Dave Ellis. I'm the editor of The Reveller, uh, which in the evening standard covers food, drink and things to do. This last year has been one of the worst in terms of the hospitality industry. It's been catastrophically hit and people have suffered. There have been huge job losses and we've seen a sector that's constantly innovated uh, and a, con uh, a sector that's in a uh, evolutionary stage. I'm joined by Jeremy King, uh, who is famous for running the Delorme, the Wall, uh, just about every restaurant that you love to go to. Um, and as part of Corbin and King, uh, he revolutionised the dining out industry. I'm also joined by Asma Khan, uh, who's just opened Darjeeling Express. It's on the corner of Garrick Street. It's uh, a wonderful, beautiful female-led uh, restaurants in Covent Garden that sort of redefining it, the restaurant scene in London. I'm also also joined by Ruth Dustin, who has been one of the leading figures in the business improvement district um, for a long time now. And Ruth is someone who over 30 years uh, has helped thousands of businesses, thousands of employees, uh, and she's generated over six billion pounds worth of further investment across major parts of central London. So I'm flattered to be here with these people. Uh, and what we're going to do here today is just to discuss what the last 14 months have meant to London, to going out uh, and all the things that we love about the city. Um, Jeremy, I thought I might start with you because over the last year you've really stepped up as a figure of importance for someone who's been champion, championing the industry. Could you talk briefly on what the pandemic has meant in terms of the constant change, the difficulties that you faced uh, and why you're raring to go now? Yeah, indeed, uh, or, or have gone and we're raring to go. So uh, the and this week has uh, vindicated that so many people want the restaurant business back. And of course, as is always the case in hindsight, we, um, the Public Health England have admitted that restaurants have not been a source of infection beyond anywhere else whatsoever, if not less because of, of the steps we've taken. Now, I, I think when we go back to March 2020, if we knew what was ahead of us, I think people would not have been so glibly baking banana bread and realizing just what was at, at stake and the the toll which has taken particularly on the staff in the restaurant industry has been massive because the 3.2 million of us well there were it's dropped below 3 million now and we've had very little rec uh, representation kate nichols at uk hospitality has been very eloquent and very persuasive but it's difficult to be truly effective and of course one of the problems we have is that there is no Minister of Hospitality and there are some fundamental in, uh, misunderstandings about the industry coupled with the fact that we have a Home Secretary who believes that everybody in the hospitality trade is of low skill uh, ability <clears throat> and therefore should have no special consideration and so my staff who are my biggest concern throughout have been living on if lucky 40% of what they could have earned because of, of this, uh, there was a big, a big misunderstanding on, on ser service charge. I think we've learned from it. I think, uh, I think we won't make the same mistakes again, uh, for sure. But I, when I look back and to when we closed, I think the way the government behaved throughout the pandemic was actually summarized that week because they said, we're not shutting restaurants but we're telling you not to go to them. And that really is how the government's treated the sector throughout. I'm getting a sense that you think the hospitality was unfairly targeted, perhaps, which is something that over the past year I've heard. Um, what, what do you think the relationship between the hospitality industry is and the government now? And do you think that's going to affect the way that restaurants, pubs and bars operate? And uh, Asma or, or Ruth, if you want to weigh in here, please, please do. I think the big test for the government is now. I think the government has passed in some ways. Um, the, you know, one could commend the government and they're very quick to take the credit for the vaccination programme. But the truth is that's Kate Bingham who is actually responsible for that. And as, <clears throat> as we learn, as we get older, success has many parents, but failure is an orphan. 
and there have been an awful lot of failures of the government. If they let us down on the whole question of rent, because there are so many people who are clinging on to, on to their staff on furlough, which costs us money. It costs us a lot of money to keep people on furlough still, hoping that the rent the rents will be dealt with because they have a year's rent. The, they're often paying anything between six and 10% in rent. And they're happy if they make a net profit of six and 10%. So everything that a restaurateur does, if they're lucky, will go towards paying off this rent, this rent backlog. So we're just hoping that the government really does step up and doesn't issue as it has done uh, guidelines avaricious, aggressive landlords, I'm afraid, don't listen to guidelines. I think it's been um, an incredibly difficult year, both professionally and personally, for uh, many, many people working in the hospitality sector. Um, I think from a central London perspective, London has suffered most compared to other parts of the country. Um, as the lockdown measures are easing, we've seen that London has started to not as recover as quickly as some of the other cities in terms of some of the data that we've got coming through. And I think if we look at the centre, and I'm not talking about the whole of Greater London, but the centre of London, I think that there's been a lack of support from central government in really supporting the hospitality and leisure sectors. Um, and this all comes back to the politics of levelling up across the rest, of the rest of the country. But without the capital, you're not going to be able to level up and we're not going to be able to see that recovery coming through because we are the economic engine of the United Kingdom. Um, and it's important that we remember that. Um, in terms of the business districts that, that we look after, we've got 150,000 employees that operate across the business partnerships that, that we work on, particularly in South Westminster. Um, and what we found is that 35,000 of those jobs have been at risk. Um, and that makes up a quarter of the employment rate for the whole of Westminster. It's uh, in essence, is the same size as the city of Derby in terms of employment rates. Um, so we've got 25% of the workforce who are currently at risk. Um, I think the other big factor is uh, obviously furlough. What we are starting to see as things are beginning to reopen is that there is obviously um, an issue around recruitment and that talent pool as well. Um, obviously, a, a lot of those overseas nationals have gone back or perhaps have found other employment opportunities and have chosen not to come back into hospitality. So we are also now finding that there is a real recruitment issue. So just as these businesses are starting to open back up, they need to be able to service that demand. Um, and the demand is there. We've got reports coming through from certain parts of central London where some uh, organisations, some hospitality venues have actually outperformed compared to 2019. So there is a lot of pent up demand there, but it's making sure we get the balance right to be able to service those needs. Mm. Well, Asma, of course, you opened up in Covent Garden this year, which is sort of in extraordinary circumstances to move a restaurant from Kingley Court, take it to Covent Garden is, is amazing. Could you speak a little bit on the demand that you've seen out there and, and what it's been like and, and sort of maybe give us an overview of what you think the, the customer wants at the moment? Uh, are you finding that they're, they're maybe ordering more or have they changed in any way since, since uh, you, you served them in Soho? Well, we've done two days of uh, dining in and we've had, mm -hmm. you know, patchy dining out because of the weather and the fact that Westminster took forever to give us permission to put our heaters out. It's been incredibly difficult. And, and, you know, both the speakers have actually covered the main area, which is, you know, we're crushed by the lack. We cannot find uh, recruits and it's not, you know, we've lost people in hospitality and to some extent it is our fault because I think when things are going really well, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, workers in hospitality didn't feel that they counted. And it and the worst thing is the government, the way that they've always seen them as unskilled. This is seen as part time. You know, I would love to have Boris Johnson serve one full service in my restaurant and he will see the skills that are required, the interpersonal, the, just the physical strength that you need to go through an entire shift. This dismissing of hospitality, uh, by by the has fed into you know a sommelier you know I met he's now making puppets and he told me I'm never going to go back and this is a problem that we've lost a lot of good people 
who found other avenues for their creativity for their life, you know, because it's just a better life that they can have. And this is our huge loss that we have. And we really, that is our biggest problem. Last night, I got a 70,000 pound business rate bill from the council. And I'm just crushed because I just think, you know, to expect us to pick up and run from July onwards, when we have, I mean, the debt I have is the same with everyone. It is just soul destroying. And then we have the business rates. I think they don't really care. You really feel like, you know, the child that has been put in one corner and told to stay there. We've been dismissed. And I think one problem we've had with hospitality is that we're a very stratified and divided industry. You have the powerful who have a voice, who have big, you know, restaurants, the well-known figures. But, you know, I, you notice this when the early part of, uh, you know, last year when Chinatown was shutting down, the great and the good kept quiet while the small mums and pubs restaurant in Chinatown closed. And that is a big problem that, you know, I know so many restaurants in Wembley that shut down, you know, that have been there for going on for ages. These are just silently withdrawn. These are the unspoken, un, you know, they've just vanished. We've lost them forever. And I think that really hospitality needs to have a hard look at ourselves. Why we didn't fight our corner. You know, if we end up like a, you know, a, a minister like Preeti Patel representing our industry, you know, there's no point. You really need to have someone very, very powerful who understands what we need as a minister. And that I think is something that is quite challenging because that person needs to be able to speak for all of us, all of us in the industry. I just wanted to jump in there because Jeremy, you mentioned earlier about the Minister for Hospitality. I find the Minister for Hospitality to be quite a curious point because on the one hand, it's great to have a voice that, that speaks to people, but on the other hand, it's not like you get to choose who that minister is. And because they, you know, it's not like the Minister for Culture necessarily has a background in the arts. And, and that would be the same thing for the, for, for the hospitality industry. Just, just because you brought it up first, Jeremy, could you, could you tell me your thoughts on the idea of the Minister of Hospitality? Do you, do you think it's a good thing? I don't think it's crucial that they know about hospitality. And actually, sadly, the case when it comes to the arts is that they know very, very little about it and, and the sensitivities, because I do a lot of work on the art side as well and have suffered the, at those hands. With the third largest employer in the country, if you have somebody who's responsible, you have a chance. At the moment, we're split between two departments and we all know what happens when you split split control is that the other thinks the other's responsible and, and so it, and so it goes on and then there's accountability and politicians are always being quite quick to 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 save their own butts and if there's a constituency out there who is after them and it can be very vociferous i think asma is absolutely right that uh, it took an awful lot for the big people to start start speaking up and in many ways i only spoke because I looked around to see who's who's leading apart from Kate Nichols. I'm, uh, although it might be surprised, I'm a naturally shy person, I thought, and I've never had a big press profile, but I said, no, somebody, somebody has to talk. And it was interesting, the, res uh, the response I was getting from the government, and, and it revealed a lot of schisms. You know, I, I would talk to ministers and I, I expect them to be admonishing me because of something I'd written in the, in the newspaper or said on TV. And they're saying, absolutely right, go for it. You know, they're behaving like idiots and we're left in that situation. And I think the accountability is such that there is um, this footage from a special committee which was discussing furlough for the restaurant business and they talked about tips. And of course, there's always this confusion as the misnomer, whether it's tips or service charge. And service charge, which is a system uh, and, and the trunk which is a tax efficient system for staff, which goes back to 1965, has been fully accepted by the government. People get mortgages, they pay their taxes on it. There's nothing underhand whatsoever. And it's the, the main part of their income and the staff prefer it that way, or used to prefer it that way. The footage shows, they said, what about tips? Oh, well, <clears throat> they're not regular and nobody pays tax on it anyway. Okay, fine, we'll just do it on the, on the house pay. And at a swoop, it, it condemned thousands and thousands of staff to not being able to afford their, 
their homes being evicted by by aggressive landlords and so on and so forth, not even being able to feed their family. And the tales have been terrible. You know, I've got senior people who've had to move into a one bedroom flat where their children sleep in the bed and they sleep on the floor and they're trying to do homeschooling, etc. It's if you compare it with what happens in France and Italy and Spain, etc., who can blame the fact that so many people when called back to work like we did said i'm really sorry i'm going to stay in europe i don't feel wanted i don't feel loved and i put that i lay that very much at the feet of pretty patel yeah asper is that something you agree with i saw you nod nodding along there no no he's absolutely right you know this uh this toxic hatred which began with the brexit referendum you know the othering of people the you know, and this is so dangerous. And now we are reaping the bitter harvest of this hatred, uh, you know, against Europeans. They are the backbone of hospitality and we really want them back, you know, and it is hurting. We are absolutely hemorrhaging because we cannot fill. And ironically, the government has never given provision, set up hospitality schools. You know, I've been doing a lot of campaigning for, to have uh, uh, you know, a college of food for London. We don't have, you cannot just get them over. This, it just means they think this is just something you can rock up and just start working as, you know, a sommelier or, or a waiter, front of house, you know, chef. You do need training. And I say this ironically as someone running an entire kitchen with, you know, housewives, but then we have life experience. We cook for 20 years at home. You know, my average age of people cooking in my kitchen is 50. You know, so we have other kind of experience, but it is so hard because there is no backup plan. There's no plan B. They just got rid and have been so hostile. And when a lot of tabloids as well, you know, amplify those voices and they feed into this kind of hatred of others. And I'm not just talking about Europeans, this is about refugees and, you know, people of color and, you know, Islamophobia, all of this kind of, this othering of other people it leaves us really, you know, stuck because, you know, no one really feels they want to come back to a hostile land where they're not wanted. It is very, very hard. It started with the Polish because Brexit was seen to be a mandate to the racist bigots and myopics in this country to hound and terrorize a lot of, a lot of the Polish staff who are living on the estates and they disappeared very quickly. And Yes, people would come into the country, work in hospitality, but we want long term workers, we want residents. And and I would just say is that London prides itself as being, if not the capital of cuisine in the world, as one of the very top. That's entirely due to the people who've come to this country. It's not from us. We were an old a reactionary class ridden society who thought the service was below them. It's thanks to the Europeans and from the people from other countries of the world that we've emerged and, and why we're so, so special. And you only have to think about the Huguenots at the end of the, what was that, the end of the 17th century. It so enriched the whole London and that increased the size of London's population by 10%. We'd never allow that now, but the Huguenots gave us culture. I think it's a very interesting question about uh, a, a minister for hospitality. Um, I think what London is lacking is very much a champion. We need a very strong champion. Um, I think if, if we have a, a minister appointed, um, they've got to have a very clear mandate to be able to support the sector. And I think for me, that's the aspect that I'm most nervous about is how much weight and sway they would actually have within central government. Uh, to be able to really represent the sector. Um, I, I think the politics just don't fit as far as I'm concerned. And I think the other the other issue we have, we've got a, a mayor for London who's unable to flex his muscles because of the issues between uh, obviously the, the GLA and central government as well. Um, but we do need a strong individual, a strong champion to really move that agenda forward for the hospitality sector. They are so part they are so important to London's ecosystem. We lost 100,000 licensed premises of closed during the pandemic. And um, that's an increase of 175% pre-COVID. Um, so there are some real issues. 
furlough hasn't finished yet, so there are going to be more casualties, sadly, within that mix. Um, but we need a voice for London. We need to have somebody really representing the sector and the industry, um, not just to service the demand, but also to create that economic growth and those employment opportunities as well. Mm. And to stop things like well, congestion charge. You know, if you look yeah. at a lot of the, 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 the change in congestion charge is if you'd briefed if you brief the authorities and said, find a way to discourage people to come into central London and use it, that would be the first, your starting point. Well, let's extend yeah. congestion charge to, uh, through the evening and over the weekend. Bonkers, absolutely bonkers. And a Minister of Hospitality would have to actually fight against that. Nobody fought against it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And of course, unfortunately, the Mayor's office and the government have been doing deals together. So it, it's, uh, it's yeah. and we're caught in the crossfire. Yeah. And what we've seen throughout all of this is it's businesses that have really stepped up to be the voice and lead the way without the political backing and support. And I think by having a strong champion, we can identify clarity, set a very clear vision and really think about how we can lobby for that ongoing support. You know, Cor Corbyn and King is a perfect example of uh, someone who has really, as a as company, has really championed um, the rest of the industry and actually asthma as well. You know, you're such a... You, you do so much for independent restaurants and, it, and it's really stood out because there maybe haven't been uh, as many voices as one might have expected. Um, just to move away from this slightly, um, what has surprised you or in sort of a pleasant way about the way that the sector has um, evolutionised over the last uh, sort of 14 months? We've seen a revolution in the way that restaurants operate and do you think that we're going back to the old normal or do you think that we're going to see the set to be something completely different uh, from now on and that's sort of an open question so uh, anyone please jump in let me just quickly answer that uh, i've just done two days of service what surprised me was that uh, we had tables walk out after drinking close to 300 400 pounds of alcohol because we were running a bit late and we tried to explain that our entire staff had not worked for a year. So I had expected a lot more kindness uh, and compassion. Mm. But then there were some people who hung around, who clapped when every dish came, who were so, so supportive. I guess you have all kinds, but it's been very tough for us because I think that, you know, we managed to get back people who we lost, you know, last year. And but one year of them, you know, working as cleaners in care homes, and you know, stacking shelves in supermarkets, it has been you know this big disconnect, and we couldn't afford to bring them in uh, for a week's training. So, sadly, everyone's been thrown into the deep end. So, but I'm, I feel you know when you walk into a room full of people eating, there's that noise, and Jeremy will know this. You know, it kind of hits you inside, and it it's so uplifting. You feel the storm is over. You feel you can mm. move on. And London has been amazing. I have to say, you know, I, and I say this very often, I could not have opened Darjeeling Express in India because every restaurant you go to, even back in South Asia, has a man cooking in the kitchen. Because we are mm. not respected, we're not seen as equal. In London, this is, I, and people ask me, oh, what kind of passport do you have? I'm a Londoner. You know, I don't, I don't see myself as Indian, I don't see myself as British. I've lived longer in this country than India. And I think that there's something about, you know, central London, once more restaurants come in, you feel that, you know, you feel, I, I, maybe it's just me being very optimistic, but you know that we're going to get back. London has been hit so many times, you know, from, you know, historically you look back, from its knees, it's always got up. And, you know, you know that this is a city that lives and breathes, you know, has that kind of, it'll come back. And I'm very optimistic. What, what's it like to be back in the dining room, to, to feel that, that buzz that Asma is talking about, that sort of hum as a restaurant gets going? It was daunting. And just like with the staff, you know, I, I, I had to take a very deep breath uh, before I went back into them because I'm trying to get around seven restaurants in central London. Um, and what I, when I was briefing all the staff during last week, um, the week before opening, I was saying, you're not going to be match fit, but I think there's going to be goodwill coming. I think something I've been saying publicly is I, 
one of the benefits is that I do believe that customers will appreciate restaurants more and crucially, and just as important, if not more important, I think restaurateurs and staff will appreciate customers more and it should it should work together. But, you know, what Asma is saying, there have been times and that's been challenged this week. Um, I ejected one man um, who was in, incredulous. He came in, he was aggressive with the staff, you know, for table wasn't quite ready and so I said we're not going to do this <clears throat> and he said what do you what do you mean you're not going to do it you have you're obliged to and I said no I, I I'm within my rights to turn you away I said we can't give you a good time you need to want to have a good time and then we're very useful because a restaurant's a catalyst for what people want to make of them and if they want to take out on us their their domestic frustrations or work problems etc they're in the, the wrong place and I'm fiercely protective of the staff but in terms of you were saying about innovations, I, I think it would be a tragedy if we haven't taken advantage of the last year. And I think we've advanced in many ways five years in the last year, in, and certainly on the technological side, the way th <clears throat> payments and even staffing, etc. And there are some really bright people. It's like the young guys who are running Stint, who is a, a company which is harnessing one of the great untapped pools of labor in not only in London, but in all capital cities, which is uh, undergraduates who are prepared to work for two or three hours at a time, do a stint, so-called, um, which is going to make life easier for us. So a lot of the more labor intensive work is gone. And so along with other ways of doing it, I think people, ex you know, I, I took the opportunity to look at um, my brigade structure in the restaurants is the ways of doing it. And actually staff hate change, but they've actually embraced all the changes which, which we can make now. I'm excited that uh, I'm hoping a lot of landlords will recognize they can't just lease to the highest bidder with the best covenant um, and that they may fail like we've seen with all the, the mid market and that they'll start to form relationships with with innovative young entrepreneurs, which is the exciting thing in, in this industry. And there should be more turnover based rent. So both sides have a have a chance to be happy. I think also, you know, people worrying, oh, nobody's going to come back into the city. Yes, they are. Even if they only come back three days a week, I actually think people will take more advantage of what London offers if they're only coming in three days a week. Otherwise, it just becomes about commuting. And so I actually think we're going to be stronger. So, you know, I wrote, I wrote to the customers just recently, I'm, I'm truly, madly, deeply optimistic, despite <laughs> the empirical. I think there's a lot more to discuss. I think that's one thing that we do need to be conscious of is that hospitality is going through such an enormous change, but people need to pay attention to it because it's constantly going through this. It's one challenge after another. We briefly touched on it earlier with the, the idea of the staffing crisis. That's an extra thing that uh, is being dealt with. There's a whole conversation to be had here, but I just want to say thank you for what we've discussed today. I think it's been uh, it's been fascinating to hear your insights. So thank you so much. There's a big thank you to our partner for this pan panel, uh, which is Primera. Um, and goodbye. Take care. Thank Bye -bye you. To you. Goodbye. Bye.